thanks for stopping on our channel which is dedicated to central heating and as you can see I've been doing this a long time. Whether you install or you have heating hopefully my videos will make a difference but please leave me a comment in the section below. Lights, action, camera, let's begin. Before we can begin fault finding, we need to make the place safe for us to work in. And in this book, the very first thing that we look at is in page 12, which is called the electrical safety test. And there's six pages all the way up to page 18, all to deal with earth, short circuit, and polarity tests that have to be done before you can start doing any fault finding. This is compulsory on every single system. So as soon as you, the engineer, come and goes into this boiler, you must go through those four parts of the safety test and of course safe isolation, TB118. There are two ways to uh, put electricity into here. We can either use a plug with a three amp fuse, of course, uh, unswitched socket and here's a photograph or we can use a double pole spur. Now as I've covered in other videos double pole spurs can be extremely dangerous because a lot of them aren't double pole they're single pole and when you switch the thing off the boiler is still live because you can have electricity coming from the controls upstairs in the airing cupboard. So, so the first thing we've done here is we're having a look. Very first thing is use your eyes and have a look inside here. Are there any telltale signs? Have a look at the automatic air vent if it's inside. Is it loose or does it look rusty like this picture does? That's a telltale sign. All this hydraulics is blocked basically and you could really be looking at a new boiler because some of these heat exchangers are an extreme challenge to flush out or power flush or whatever and obviously if you replace the engine you might as well replace all of it so have a look at some of these side panels as well the insulation or fireproofing stuff but mostly the soundproofing as well uh, is it all leaving is it all dropped down does it look like a mess probably if it does consider a new boiler the customer's not had the correct service. They either haven't called a good factory trained engineer or somebody who's been here. They've just left it and left it and left it. And finally, the boiler's choked itself up. All we can do is give them an estimate for a new one. And don't forget, get 50% in advance, always. You know, we love our customers. Trust, never. Get 50% upfront for a boiler change or any other major repair. So. This is the first part. Let's move on and see what's next. This next stage, number two, is all about testing. So we have two modes, hot water or central heating. So the question is, installer, which is the best way to test the function of this boiler and the system as a whole? Do we turn the tap on or we turn the heating on? Well, if you've answered turn the hot tap on or the hot water circuit, you are wrong. It's always central heating. It has to be because of several points. Number one, certain boilers, for example, don't use a pump in the hot water mode. So if it's seized up, I won't know. Also, if you turn the tap on and casually walk away, and maybe this boiler's at the other end of the house, or even worse in the loft, whilst that tap's running, I don't think the householder's gonna be jumping for joy watching that perform. So that's a couple of reasons why central heating mode is really the best. And as we all know, we always wire up systems in central heating first, and then the hot water side. When we do fault finding, we do central heating fault finding comes first and then the hot water side because heating is the most expensive part of our gas or oil bill. So therefore it makes sense for us to concentrate on the heating. So before I'm gonna turn on the boiler, I'm gonna go over to the room thermostat 
and turn it down. So normally, this would be maybe 18 degrees or 17 degrees. Make sure it's a nice low temperature, which it should be. Then we can go back to the boiler and turn on the mains. It may have a function where it does a pre-ignition test, moves the diverter, moves the fan, checks the sensors, the water pressure, all that sort of thing, and then it'll be nice and quiet, ready for a demand. So always look in the manual for the boiler that you're working on, because that will tell you exactly what will happen as soon as you put 230 volts onto that PCB. So now we've turned it on, we're going to put the heating to constant or on. Always those two settings, either constant or on that. Then we go back to our room thermostat and we press and hold the top button until it clicks and then we know that it's going to kick into action and the boiler fires up. So what we've actually done is we've checked that the programmer is plugged in and the room thermostat is plugged in because if we have lots of installations where the room thermostat is either broken or it's not actually wired up and this very simple test tells us if the boiler starts to fire up everything is fine but if it doesn't we need to find out which part has gone wrong is it the programmer not getting the electricity and not coming out so the electricity going into a programmer is called the common the electricity going out from the programmer into the room thermostat is called switch live. The electricity going into the room thermostat is called the common, and the electricity leaving is called switched live, which then goes back to the boiler to fire it up. So it's just a continuous 230 volts or wireless, whatever they're using. But somehow or other, when the room thermostat is in demand, that boiler should respond. And we can do another test. What we can actually do here is just measure whether on the heating side, you've actually got a signal coming back from the room thermostat. So now the boiler's up and running and it's working fine. We can turn the heating off. So we can go back to the room thermostat, press the lower number, and it drops down below the actual temperature and the boiler should then switch off. Now we go over to the hot tap and then we turn the tap on and immediately the boiler should go through its sequence and then fire up. But what we do is we feel the flow pipe. So whilst the tap is running, that flow pipe, if it gets hot and hotter and hotter, that means the diverter valve needs replacing for the latest version. Not a recon, we can lend them a recon, but we're basically going to change from broken to the latest version, as we do with all components. And that's the very first test we do, is the diverter valve. Before we can switch the boiler on and put it through its paces, because we know it's electrically safe, we just need to have a look at the other half of the boiler, is the water side. You've got a gauge. Make sure it's about one bar for any property that's three bedrooms or smaller. If it's larger, as with other videos, 1.4. But if you're coming to a boiler and you're already seeing one and a half bar or even higher, you need to depressurize down to one bar because we want to test that expansion vessel and it probably it's flat, which is done now regularly. A lot, of, a lot of manufacturers will say every 12 months, drain the boiler, flush it out, check the, uh, the, in, the water inhibitor as it were, make sure there's plenty of it and repressurize this one. It's a very good idea to do this, as I said, on an annual basis, because these lungs make an efficient system. So in the book, page 25, we've got our sequence and our pressures. So everything in this is actually laid out from beginning to end, so you can follow through. I've got lots of hints and tips and tricks that I've picked up from 
working on these boilers for 45 years and training for 20 of them as well. So I've put all of that lot with my colleagues from technical and training, and we've put an awful lot of work into this book to make your life easier to find where the fault is. So as I said earlier, we always test in heating because it gives us control and we could just press a button and something happens. So as soon as we press the button in central heating, the room stat kicks in if there's a demand and the first item that works will be the pump. The pump will then start circulating around here and it will be a wire that's got a dead end. It's just live neutral on earth. So the PCB needs to have a switch or a sensor which changes. That change is somewhere down here in the water section or it's a clipped on sensor or a clip on stat. So pump, sensor, stat. The next thing that will happen, exactly the same, is for the fan. The fan will start to run and it has a live neutral and an earth and that will need a switch or a sensor to tell the board that's actually activating. So we've got pump, switch sensor, fan switch sensor. And then when we go to the other part of the ignition sequence, the first thing they all do is send a message to the high limit stat up the top. If that's okay, it'll go back down to these two end user thermostats. Are they high enough? And are they in the right values? So we get that information from the book and it'll tell you at 60 degrees, it'll be so many ohms. That's how we do it. The other thing, of course, we've got a component, which is the gas valve. So the gas valve needs two things. It needs some sort of electricity, either AC or DC and gas. Well, we can easily measure the gas with a manometer and we can assume it's been working, so there's nothing wrong with the gas supply, but we still need to check it just in case something is wrong at the meter or at the pipes. So then we need to look in the manual, how many ohms or hertz does this gas valve need to ignite? And apart from the voltage, which could be AC or DC. We can do that well within five minutes and find out where it's gone wrong. So that's the breakdown and the fault finding testing on this type of boiler. Thanks for watching the video and if you'd like to comment there's a section below and subscribe to our channels for regular updates on our next projects. Take care.